Welcome back everyone. So our last module was on memory and that was the end of our section on information processing and now we're beginning our second big section on motor control and the first topic we're going to look at um, is vision and we're going to start with the neuroanatomy of the visual system and just look at the beginning of how vision is used to guide our action but we'll elaborate that on that uh, over this and the next two modules. So first up, vision is important. Uh, it, amongst our other senses, is often one of the most dominant senses, the one that we rely on the most, and it can be one of our most accurate senses as well. So here, obviously for these penguins, you know, look before you leap uh, is, is an important thing for them to consider. I don't know if this is a real photo, but I do know that killer whales will eat penguins, so it's possible that this actually happened. But I do want to stress, even though uh, we're going to focus on vision, we're going to look at vision a lot, that vision is not vital. Uh, one does not need vision, and you can uh, get on fine with, with just uh, your, your other eight senses. And just a few examples of that. First off here, this is a painting of Louis Braille, the inventor of the, the Braille writing system. He himself was blind and came up with this as a better way to um, have a written language for people who are, are blind. Another great example is Stevie Wonder. So he's a musician, singer, songwriter. Let me check my facts here. He's won 22 Grammy Awards, or at least last I checked, he had won 22 Grammy Awards. He's an activist. He was instrumental in making Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a holiday in the US. And he's a United Nations messenger of the peace. And he's done all this without vision. So you don't need vision. Uh, another example, more kinesiology focused, is Marla Runyon, the woman here leading, leading the pack. In 1994, she got a master's degree, so she did that without uh, vision. So I should comment uh, on Marla here. She is legally blind, so she does have some vision. Uh, she uh, was born with normal sight and then um, had macular degeneration which means that central part of her visual field, the part where the, the only part where we see things clearly, that part of her vision uh, degraded. So she still can see, she can see in the peripheries. Now your peripheral vision uh, is not sharp, so it wouldn't be very detailed. And also uh, color isn't detected very well in the peripheries. So she, her, her color vision would, would be poor. I'm not quite sure how uh, intact it is in her specifically. So she's legally blind. Uh, she won five gold medals in the Paralympics, and in the year 2000, she also competed in the Sydney Olympics. And she was the first legally blind athlete to compete in uh, the Olympics, uh, as well as the Paralympics. Um, uh, so she was in that race uh, in 2000, she finished eighth in the 1500 meter, and her time was four minutes and eight seconds which is very fast. I don't think I would be anywhere near uh, Marla. <laughs> and she did all that, um, not being completely blind, but, but legally blind. So, you know, she has accomplished many things even without vision. So I just wanted to put that up front. You know, as we're talking about vision, I might say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an important sense. It's a dominant sense. And that's if we have it. Uh, when you have several senses, our, our brain tends to rely more on vision, but if you don't have vision, then you can use your other senses. So vision is a, a very well studied uh, and, and understood topic. And we know a lot about vision down to the cellular level. So here, this is an image of the retina. So the inside part of your eye, the, the light sensitive part, and it has these different types of cells um, that are, are sensitive to light and they come down to these these rods and cones and there's a lot going on there and we're not really going to worry too much uh, about the, the cellular level. Uh, we're going to focus um, on the neuroanatomy. We'll look at the major pathways but we're going to focus more on uh, the conscious and we'll also see the subconscious processing of visual information. So here we see 
a schematic of the neuroanatomy of the, the visual system. And I've put a star on this slide because uh, this, is, this is an important diagram and you'll likely see something like this uh, on, on a test. So, first of all, we have, uh, imagine you're looking ahead to your visual field and this is kind of color coded. So imagine you're looking straight ahead and this is a weird room and for whatever reason, everything to the left of where you're fixating happens to be red and everything to the right of where you're fixating happens to be green. So that's weird, but we're just using that to illustrate the organization within the visual system. Now we've already talked about how anything you see to the right of fixation is gonna to go to your left primary visual cortex. So you can see that green wall to the right of your fixation ends up going to your left primary visual cortex. And the red wall that you see to the left of your fixation, that your left visual field, it ends up uh, going to your right primary visual cortex. So again, we're seeing the crossing of the input. But we're gonna track this pathway uh, more precisely now. So these lines here represent light bouncing off of the wall and hitting your retina. So information from your left visual field will go to both eyes. And in, in the left eye, it hits this side of your retina. It's called the, the, the nasal uh, side because it's by your nose. And then this side over here, we call that the temporal side because it's by your, your temporal bone. Now, you might be thinking, well, both eyes, once you're really far into the peripheries, then yes, it's true that only one eye so only my left eye sees my left hand and only my right eye sees my right hand. We're not gonna worry about that. We're gonna just deal, we're gonna, we're gonna restrict ourselves to thinking about the part of our visual field that the left eye can see my left hand and my right eye, oh, I have to move a little further, <laughs> and my right eye can see my right hand. So we're not gonna worry about the very periphery, yes, where only uh, one eye would see that. We're gonna deal with more centrally where this left hand can be seen by my left eye and by my right eye. So that's the left visual field and it's seen by both eyes. Uh, both retina receive rays of light that bounce off that but they hit different sides of the retina. Uh, and then things in the right visual field they're gonna hit the opposite sides of those retina. So here it's gonna be the temporal side of the left retina and the nasal side of the right retina. So after the retina that information travels down the optic nerve. So that's this part of the nervous system here. And this happens to be your second cranial nerve, so cranial nerve two. Then this information uh, arrives at the optic chiasm. And that's this structure here, and it looks kind of like an X. I believe chiasm means X or, or crossing in Latin. And you can think of this as kind of like two highways meeting, and this is where uh, the information is then gonna get organized. So after the optic chiasm, note how now those green pathways, information from the right visual field, they're now on the left, and those red pathways that started from the left visual field, they're now on the right. So the optic chiasm is where the um, action potentials get organized and they, they cross. So that everything we see in the right is now in the left uh, hemisphere and everything we see on the left is now in the right hemisphere. So after the optic chiasm, these pathways here are called the optic tracts, and they continue to the lateral geniculate nucleus. So there, there's one here on the left hemisphere, and there's one here in the right hemisphere. There is a, a, a divergence here. So there's one pathway that goes off this way. This is our subcortical pathway because it's going to the subcortex and then uh, with the dashed lines here. And then we have the cortical pathway because it remains within the cortex. So let's follow, follow the cortical pathway first. So from the lateral geniculate nucleus in either the left or right hemisphere, it travels uh, through the hemisphere and these are called optic radiations. And that takes uh, the information to its initial destination, we'll call it, uh, the, the primary visual cortex. So here in the other hemisphere, we have the optic radiations going to the primary visual cortex in the right hemisphere. Now, the primary visual cortex, or V1, as you, you may see it described sometime, is not the be-all, end-all of visual processing, it's merely the beginning. And in a bit, we'll look at higher levels of visual processing within the brain. 
Let's go back to our subcortical pathway, so shown with the dotted lines here. So from the optic track, the cortical pathway goes to the lateral geniculate nucleate and lateral geniculate nucleus and then on um, to the primary visual cortex. The subcortical pathway from the optic track, instead of going to the lateral geniculate nucleus, goes down here to the superior colliculus within the brain stem and that could be in, on either side of the brain stem. And then that infor tra information travels up a little to the pulvinar nucleus. And what we'll look at in a little bit is what are the roles of these two pathways? What does the subcortical pathway do for us? And what does the cortical pathway do for us? Uh, but that's jumping a little bit ahead. Ah, one last note I want to make on the division between these two pathways is you might be wondering, well, how much of uh, visual information goes cortically and how much subcortically. So 90% stays cortical and 10% goes subcortical. So you might be thinking, okay, 10% going subcortically, that's maybe not very much. And although it's a lot smaller than 90%, that 10% of subcortical visual information is still more than the entirety of, of the information within the auditory pathway. So although it's only 10%, it's still a significant uh, uh, amount of neurons and amount of processing occurring uh, within the brain. So here's uh, just a few more views of the neuroanatomy to the visual system. And on a test, uh, it will be this diagram. These other diagrams are, are figures I just want to show you to give you a better appreciation for what this looks like. So here are the eyes uh, cut in half for whatever reason. So these would be the retina here, and then the, this is the optic nerve. So one for the left eye, one for the right eye. Here they are meeting at the optic chiasm, so that's that X structure. And if you looked at the brain from the bottom and pulled it apart a little bit, that the optic chiasm is, is quite a visible structure. And then going uh, out from the optic chiasm would be the optic track. Here's a picture of the brain stem. And there's you know a lot of things here, but I've highlighted the important ones. So this is the optic nerve. It's being cut. So if, if it uh, went out further, that would go to the eye. But they're coming in. We're just seeing a little bit of the optic nerve before it gets to the optic chiasm. And then these would be the, the optic tracks here. Here again, we're looking at uh, the brainstem, but we're, we're looking at the back of it now. And one prominent feature are these four bumps at the back here. And these two, one on each side, these are the superior colliculi. So we talked about how uh, the subcortical pathway goes down to the superior colliculus. And then the, the, the lower two are actually the, the inferior colliculi, which um, are not um, highly involved in the visual processing. So we won't uh, talk too much more about them. Here's an actual brain, and part of the uh, this, this hemisphere has been remo removed so that we can really clearly see the optic nerve. Um, so the optic nerves would be here and here. They've been being cut, but normally these would continue, and then you'd have an eyeball. Uh, these aren't the optic nerves here. These are these are the olfactory nerves. Uh, this is for our sense of smell. So the optic nerves we just see a tiny bit, but again, this X structure that's the optic chiasm. Leaving those would be the, the optic track. Uh, it's a little hard to follow this through, but if we use the labels here, this is the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then you see this huge bundle of fibers here? Uh, this is the optic radiation. Uh, so this is actually, that other diagram, you know, just looked like a line, everything looked to be the same size, but the optic radiations are actually a huge structure, taking all that visual information back to the, the primary visual cortex. So this is a view uh, where the primary visual cortex has been highlighted. So on the surface of the brain, if we you know, take the skull off, there's actually just a little bit on the back of the surface. But if we have a cross-sectional view of the brain, uh, the, the primary visual cortex extends you know, deep within the cortex. So really only a little bit's visible on the outside, and then a lot of it continues on uh, inside. So it's the primary visual cortex, sometimes called V1. Uh, other names for it are the calcarine fissure, 
uh, which is the name of this this fissure here or this uh, this kind of tunnel or groove. Um, so because the prior visual cortex straddles the calcarine fissure, it's sometimes uh, given that name, uh, also called the striate cortex. And lastly, another interesting one is it's also Broadman's area 17. And I don't know if you've heard of Broadman areas before, uh, but they're they're kind of interesting. So many years ago, uh, I really wish I had written in my notes how long ago this was, but uh, there was a researcher named Broadman who studied the brain, and this is a long time before things like fMRI, and what he had at his disposal was a microscope. So he looked at the brain with a microscope, and he looked at the, the cellular architecture. He looks in a microscope, what do the cells look like? And uh, we know far more now about the cellular architecture of the brain, but what Broadman did is he just looked, and whenever the cells changed, so maybe a, suddenly a new structure appeared, maybe there was a new layer, maybe uh, a layer was now uh, bigger than it used to be. He gave that um, area a new number. So I don't know if he started in the middle of the brain, but Broadman's area, uh, areas one, two, and three are the somatosensory cortex here, and four is the primary motor cortex. Um, and Brahman didn't know that, but he just looked at this area and it had a, a certain distinctive cellular architecture to it. And then when he moved forward a little bit, it changed. So he said, okay, I'm gonna call this, uh, you know, one, two, three, there's probably some small variations in one versus two and three. And then four, he said, oh, all of a sudden it's very different and it's it's all the same through here. So he was was delineating the, the structure of the brain. And the neat thing that we now know is that the structure and the function of the brain are highly correlated. So whenever the structure changed, then the function likely changes as well. So even though this was done a long time ago with just a microscope and a, um, you know, definitely not the deep understanding and, and complex tools we now have, the Brahman numbers still exist because the structure of the brain um, uh, d still tells us something about the function of the brain. So for example, what he labeled area four, we now know is the primary motor cortex. And area 17 happened to be uh, back here, uh, which is the primary visual cortex. So sometimes you'll see it referred to as uh, Brahman area 17. And there's many more examples of, of his, his numbering within the brain that, uh, that, that still uh, delineates the, the function of specific areas, even though Brahman had no idea of that, he could only study the structure. I like this picture of the brain. It doesn't show everything, uh, every step along the way, but you get a better idea of kind of what it looks like in 3D. So we'd have our, our retina, uh, we, the, the optic nerve is kind of hidden in the optic chiasm, but here's the optic tract heading to the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then remember that huge bundle of fibers we saw, those are your optic radiation. So they're just kind of sweeping through the brain, traveling back to the primary visual cortex or Brahman area 17. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good tour of the neuroanatomy. And on a test, um, you don't need to know all those other figures. Um, it, it, it would be either this diagram or there's actually one more, more uh, a schematic base one of the, the visual system that we'll see a little bit later. I think one way to help learn about this is to look at injury to this pathway and how that affects our vision. So it's one thing to say, yeah, you know, it goes from the right, goes through all these structures. Uh, but, but if we start to think about, well, what if you damage your optic radiations? Um, what impact would, have that, would, would that have on your visual experience? And I think doing this will really help us learn uh, about this visual pathway. So first of all, a couple of terms uh, to refer to damage to our visual pathway. First up is anopia, and that just means absence uh, of sight. And we're gonna look at two specific examples of this. We have hemianopia, so hemi meaning half, so absence of sight in half of your visual field. And this image here is an example of that. Um, well, there, there's kind of three different examples of hemianopia, and, and we'll look at each of those. Um, so as, as I've noted here, it could be that for some reason both eyes can't see the left side of the world, 
that's hemianopia. It could be both eyes can't see the right side of the world, or you can even have your left eye can't see the left side of the world, right side can't see the right side of the world, or, or vice versa. Those are also hemianopia, but we'll see examples of those. So quadrantinopia, so quadrant, think a quarter of your visual field. So it's absence of sight and a quarter of your visual field. So you can lose just a quarter of your, of your visual field and we'll see examples of this. And lastly, uh, scotoma, this is loss of vision in a part of your visual field. So it's just you know a little area where you can't see. Uh, and this uh, is also known as a blind spot. We all actually have uh, a scotoma uh, built into our visual pathway because if you think about the retina where it reaches where the optic nerve attaches in that area there's actually the there's no light sensitive cells in the retina because the optic nerve is more or less in the way so if light hits this part of my retina you know I see something I see something but if it hits right where the optic nerve is you don't see anything and there's a few tricks you can do um, to uh, hold your eyes still and try to make that blind spot appear. Because what happens normally as we're moving our eyes around, so we, we've already looked at how we make lots of short uh, fixations, 50 to 200 milliseconds, and then our eyes are constantly cicading, and our brain kind of fills in the gaps. Uh, so what you need to do to make that blind spot become a, uh, visible is, you know, look straight, you know, not be blinking, and then use a few tricks uh, to have your brain kind of stop filling in that hole for you. But we all actually have a blind spot. Uh, although there can be other reasons, um, say if you damage part of your retina, you could lose vision in, in a specific area of your visual field. Hemianopia and quadrantinopia are highlighted because we're going to see examples of, of those two next. So here is another schematic of our visual pathway. And this is the one that we're going to use to talk about damage. So this one's color coded. Looks like I've uh, it's now blue instead of green, and red has has flipped sides. But similar idea. Imagine looking ahead to a wall that for some reason you're looking in the middle, and everything to the left is blue, everything to the right is red. That what you see in your right visual field goes to your left primary visual cortex. So you can see this is where the rays of light travel, and they. Um, after the optic chiasm, they go to the left hemisphere and they end up going to the left primary visual cortex. And what you see in, in the left visual field, the opposite happens, it crosses over to the right primary visual cortex. And here we're just going to look at the cortical pathways, uh, not the subcortical pathway. So here's the lateral geniculate nucleus, and we're going to talk about everything traveling down the optic radiations to the primary visual cortex. We're not going to worry about how some information does go from the optic track to the superior clicklist. We won't worry about that right now. In terms of damage, we're going to look at damage in seven locations. So it could be that you uh, have your left optic nerve cut, and, or you know it could be the right side that would just give you kind of a mirror image of the damage. You might have damage right in the middle of your optic chiasm or just on the edges. Maybe you've cut your optic track. The, um, lateral parts of your optic radiations, the more medial parts, or say all of your optic radiations or all of your primary uh, visual cortex. Some of these are more common than others. Uh, some of them are more hypothetical, that, so they allow us to think about how the visual pathways work. The ones that are more clinically relevant, I'll, I'll mention as we go through uh, when and how those those sometimes occur. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a diagram of what you see. So this is an example of normal vision. This is your left eye, this is your right eye, and your left eye can see, so if I think just about my left eye, I can, it can see the left side of the world, so that's uh, shown here, and it can see the right side of the world, shown here. Now if I think about my right eye, it can see the right side of the world, and it can see the left side of the world. So this would be normal vision. Both eyes see both sides of the world. And again, we're going to ignore the very peripheries where really only one eye or the other can see those. We're going to just think about this kind of central space where my left eye sees my left hand and my right eye sees my left hand. 
Now, no vision, so imagine you close your eyes, you know, you now no longer see anything, and the way we're going to depict that is by, by filling them in gray. So the left eye doesn't see anything on the left side of the world, doesn't see anything on the right side of the world, and the same thing uh, for the right eye. So we're going to look at, uh, first off, what happens if you damage your left optic nerve? What does your vision look like? You know, it's not going to be normal vision. You're going to lose some vision. You're not going to lose everything, but what will it look like exactly? So first off, left optic nerve. Uh, what does this look like? This one actually is uh, of clinical relevance. Um, this, um, this is, well, I don't know, I was going to say this is the most typical, I don't know for sure, but this can happen with multiple sclerosis. Um, you can have a flare-up and for whatever random reason your optic nerve is attacked and doesn't necessarily mean both, sometimes it's just the one in your left hemisphere. And with multiple sclerosis what happens is the optic nerve, the, the axon itself, uh, demyelinates. So the myelin disappears and if you go back to your physiology of neurons, without the myelin, saltatory conduction doesn't work very well and basically the signal is going to be sent and when it gets to the part that's demyelinated, that's, that signal will stop if you lose enough of the myelin. Another thing that could happen is uh, if you lost your eye, so that would be your eyeball, but if you don't have an eyeball, then you know no information is going to travel down uh, your optic nerve. And one in some ways damage to your left optic nerve isn't too hard to think about because we can simulate it by just closing your left eye. So, you know, we haven't cut your optic nerve, but by closing your eye, uh, nothing is getting there. So what we would say is that, you know, your left eye sees nothing, it's closed, and your right eye still sees everything, it's open. So this one isn't too hard to think about because we can actually sort of simulate it by closing our left eye. That strategy though is going to fail when we get deeper within the, the visual system. So I'm going to show you a, a better strategy to determine uh, what a vision has been lost. And this method uh, is, is kind of drawing back from the damage to the world to find out what has been lost. So let's do this one over with this new drawing back strategy. So we're, we're talking about number one, uh, a, a cut through your left optic nerve. So we need to, to look at one side of damage at a time. So we've cut this blue pathway and this red pathway. So let's start with the blue pathway. You could start with either, but we're just going to start with the blue one. And we want to trace this back to the eye. Here we don't have to go very far. So this cut goes to the left eye. So that tells us we're going to lose something in our left eye. To figure out which side of the eye it is, we need to then follow this pathway back to the world. So from the left eye, it goes to the left side of the world. So in the left eye, we are going to lose vision in the left side of the world. So that is, is the first half of the damage here. So that's only the first half because we just looked at half of this uh, damage pathway. Now let's do the red one. So we're going to trace it back to the eye. We don't have to go very far again. But this goes to the left eye. So we're going to have damage to our left eye. Which side of our left eye is it? Well, we need to figure out um, which side of the world this retina sees. So we follow this line and it allows us to see the right side of the world. So the damage is in our left eye and it's the right side of the world. So we're going to lose this half of our visual perception. Oops. So that is the tracing back method. And although one, you can just say, OK, I close my eye, don't see anything in that eye. This tracing back method, though, will allow us to map out damage to two, three, uh, and four, um, which number four we can't really simulate. So this is going to be very handy. 5, 6, and 7, there's a little bit of a caveat there which we'll get to. Okay, let's try this again, but for damage to 2. This one is probably more hypothetical. It would be odd for you to have an injury that takes out just the outside of both sides of your optic chiasm. So this pathway is cut, and this pathway is cut, but the middle is intact. Number three will be the opposite. Three we'll look at when the middle is cut. So it'd be very weird uh, for this to happen. You know, maybe you get a pin that goes in both sides of your head. You know, that's weird, right? But this is just um, 
more theoretical to help us under understand this pathway. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out what we lose from this cut to our pathway and what we lose uh, from this cut to our pathway. So I forget which one I do first. Okay, here we go. So let's look at the left side first. So we're going to trace this back to figure out which eye is affected. It's the right eye, so it's going to be the right eye. We've lost one of the hemispheres to our right eye. Which side is it of our right eye? Well, it's the left side of the world. So we go to our right eye and we're going to lose the left side of the world. That's the first half of the damage. Now we need to, to trace this pathway. So we've also cut this pathway here and we're going to trace this back to the eye. Okay, that goes to the left eye. Oh, this should still be grayed out. I hope it reappears in a moment. So we're going to lose something in our, uh, in our left eye. Which side of the world is it? Well, it's the right side of the world. So we're going to lose vision here. Okay, good. Both grays turned back on. I'll try to fix that before I upload the slide. So if uh, you've damaged the outside of both of your, uh, of, of your optic chiasm, you would have hemianopia in both eyes. So your left eye only sees the left side of the world and your right eye only sees the right side of the world. So both eyes have la lost half of the visual field. And we'll come back in a moment to um, demonstrate you know, what, this, what this would mean for your visual experience. Using that tracing back method, what I'd like you to do is um, in a moment pause the video and see if you can go through that procedure again for number three and for number four. So give it a try. Um, and if, if you have trouble, maybe rewatch how we did one and two. Uh, but if you're still really struggling with it, then um, in, in a moment I'll show you the answer uh, and hopefully that will uh, formalize this process for you. So this is what hopefully you got uh, for, for number three and number four. So for number three, you've damaged just the middle of your optic chiasm. This can happen. We'll talk about it in just a moment. And so you've cut this blue pathway and this red pathway. And what you should have found is, is uh, it's going to be the exact opposite of two. I mean, two, if you think about it, we've cut this pathway and this pathway. Well, three, we've cut the other two pathways. So two and three should be the exact opposite of each other. So for three, it's now your left eye can see the right side of the world and your right eye can see the left side of the world. And for four, this one kind of makes sense because by the time you get to the optic track, visual information has been separated so that um, what we see is now in the contralateral hemisphere. So we've cut both these red pathways, which is going to be information from the right side of the world, uh, half uh, that information from the left eye and from the right eye. This is also an example of hemianopia. Um, so the left eye can only see half the world and the right eye can only see half the world. It doesn't matter which half the world you can see, you know, whether it's two, three, or four, all three of these are examples of hemianopia. Let's talk about what these look like and, and when they might happen. So three, here's your optic chiasm. We're looking at a cross section zoomed in here and right below your optic chiasm is your pituitary. And if you get a, a tumor on your pituitary, uh, so a tumor is, a, is an abnormal growth that gets bigger, and notice that below the pituitary we have bone. So the tumor can't go down anywhere, it hits bone, so it's going to push up. And it's going to push up on just the middle of your optic chiasm. And if you think of your, your nerves kind of like pipes, like a, a garden hose, if you push those too much, you know, the water's not going to be able to flow anymore. For a nerve, if you compress them too much, the action potential won't be able to travel through there. So number three can actually happen when you have a tumor on your pituitary that puts pressure on the middle of the optic chiasm, taking out um, those signals. So it's not necessarily that the middle of the optic chiasm has been cut, but the neurons, uh, the communication of the neurons has been impeded by that pressure. So what would number three look like? So with both eyes open, 
you would actually see the whole world relatively normally. So on the peripheries might be a little different, but we're not going to worry about those. Now, why is that? Well, it's because your left eye can see the right side of the world and your right eye can see the right. Oh, I think I've mixed up. Let me try that again. <laughs> okay, your left eye can see the right side of the world and your right eye can see the left side of the world. And your brain is always stitching together the visual information from both eyes. So each eye can see half of the world. So together, you consciously perceive the whole world. That's with both your eyes open. Um, where, where you would realize that you have hemianopia is if you close one eye. So if you close your right eye, all you have to rely on is your left eye, and suddenly the left, eye, left side of the world would disappear. It probably wouldn't be as drastic as you know a straight black line, but it would go from you seeing to not seeing quite quickly. So you know maybe a bit of a a, a gradient or a transition in the middle. I'm just trying to be very uh, cl clear between our our left and right visual field distinctions here. So that was uh, that's if you close your right eye. If you close your left left eye, your right eye is open. Then the other side of the world would disappear, and the side of the world that that you previously couldn't see would all of a sudden appear. But again, imagine with both eyes open, one eye sees this, one eye sees that, your brain stitches that together, and you see the whole world. So three is not the worst hemianopia, because with both of your eyes open, you would largely see the entire visual scene, save for some loss in your peripheries. Two is similar, go back here, because each eye can see a different half of the visual field, your brain would stitch that together, and you would consciously perceive uh, most of the world. Four, so we've talked about four, we haven't talked about seven yet, but this is uh, also hemianopia, but in this case it doesn't matter which eye you open or close because both eyes have, lo have lost the same uh, visual field. For four or seven you have lost the right visual field. So with both eyes open you would only see uh, the left side of the world. Let's look at five, six, and seven, and this is where the caveat comes up and tracing it back doesn't work perfectly. And it's because there is a nucleus here, the lateral geniculate nucleus, that the optic radiations go through, uh, and then, well, I guess we're going backwards here, but the optic tract goes to the nucleus, then to the optic radiations. And this schematic is a bit simplified. See how it kind of looks like this goes here and that goes here? It's not actually the case the nucleus, there's a, a lot of, of routing of information. So five actually connects to this pathway and that pathway. And six, uh, likewise, connects to that pathway and to that pathway. And I, I tried changing this figure to put those on, and it, it just gets too complex. Uh, but because five and six connect to both of those uh, pathways, tracing it back doesn't quite work. So what we need to remember for five and six and later for seven is that five and six are very similar to four. Uh, so four, which we see here, but five, these optic radiations are the ones that are a little more lateral and a little more superior in the brain. And those ones actually see the upper part of our visual field. So if you take those out, you're gonna lose just the upper part of the visual field on, um, uh, on the right of both eyes. So five is like four, but it's just the top corner. So basically this is our first example of quadrantinopia. And six, those are the optic radi radiations that are more medial and inferior, and they're gonna see the opposite part of the visual field. They see the lower part of the visual field. Ooh. Okay, well I guess we'll come back to that in a second. What would five look like? You, um, even with both eyes open, because both eyes have lost the same quadrant, you would not see the upper right visual field very well. And again, it wouldn't be this you know, distinct line, but uh, a gradient from you know, vision to no vision. And this would be most extreme when your eyes are still. As you look around, your brain would try to fill in that information. It wouldn't be as successful as it is with, say, a scotoma or where our optic nerve hits our retina, because it's a big area where you've lost vision. Um, but it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be like this uh, in, unless you keeping your eyes you know nice and still. All right, back to six. So six again, it's like four, 
but now these optic radiations are just the lower part of the visual field. Now 7, 7 is really going to be the same as 4 because 4 we've cut both of these red pathways, 7 we've cut both of these red pathways. The only difference is that it's a little further along the visual pathway but the result is the same. Uh, you're going to lose vision um, in both eyes in your uh, right visual field. So 4 and 7 are actually uh, symptomatically identical. Um, there is going to be a, a difference between them uh, later and I would argue that it would actually be better to have uh, your damage further in your optic pathway. So 7 is better to have than 4 and that's because remember this this pathway, the, the subcortical pathway? If you damage 7, that subcortical pathway is intact. If you damage 4, uh, you've probably lost it. The information that goes subcortically from the optic track to the superior colliculus. And we'll talk about what that pathway uh, does for us a little later. Ah, oh, yeah, so here again, 4 or 7, uh, you are, even with both eyes open or either eye open, you're not going to see anything in your right visual field. So if that tracing back method is, is intuitive, it works for you right away, great. If it doesn't, I, I find some students have more trouble with it than others, then you know go back through this video, try doing them again yourself, you know, send me an email if you need help, because uh, it's it's important that you understand how to do that, and you'll you'll definitely have to apply that knowledge uh, on the test. So so far we focused on this cortical pathway from the retina to the lateral geniculate nucleus to the primary visual cortex. So, you know, we, we've skipped a few structures in here and we talked about how vision makes it to the primary visual cortex, but that is not uh, the end of visual processing. You know, it, it's really just the beginning. I'm just moving my slides ahead here. Okay. So we, a lot of the brain is involved in visual processing. There's lots of visual areas in the occipital cortex, and then as we move forward to the parietal cortex, to the temporal cortex, we also start combining visual information uh, with other information to, to understand um, our world in a multi-sensory uh, sort of way. So V1, prime visual cortex, uh, it sends information to V2, which sends information to V3, to V4, and V5. So information can be sequential, through these areas in some cases, but notice how V1 also sends information directly to V5. So there's a lot of parallel processing going on in the visual system, which makes it very challenging to understand. Another thing that we see besides parallel processing, so V1 goes both to V2 and V5, V2 here, see how it connects back to V1? So V1 is gonna process um, very basic visual information goes to V2 and kind of the higher it goes, uh, the higher order aspects of vision that are processed. So we'll see later on in the brain, uh, you start to um, decode color or movement. Whereas very early on, it might just be um, being able to see a transition between you know, light and dark or an edge, you know, very simple uh, visual uh, features. Uh, so it is sequential sometimes, there's also parallel processing, there's reciprocal connections where V2, based on what it sees from what V1 sent it, it then sends information back to V1 to change its subsequent processing. So it's very complex. It's a bit of a divide and conquer strategy. So each area um, has some specific functions and we'll talk about some of the areas that do very specific things. So we'll look at uh, color processing and we'll look at uh, motion. Which areas do those and what happens if, if we lose them? Now that, that last slide we looked at was saying, hey, this is more complex uh, you know, than, than I told you originally, you know, visual processing is not just in our prior visual cortex. Well, that slide was also simplifying things. So this is a much more realistic schematic of visual processing. I think this is actually from uh, a monkey or, or a primate, um, but visual processing in, in primates is, is very similar uh, to humans. 
And you can see here, uh, so there, there's our primary visual cortex, for example, but these areas are crazy interconnected. There's a lot going on, uh, which makes it very challenging to understand. You know, the brain is very complex, uh, and something as complex as visual processing that involves a lot of the brain is also going to be very complex. So it's, it's very challenging and uh, exciting to study because of this complexity.